The following program is brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom. I'm Adam Olivero and thank you very much for joining me for a special documentary called You're Not Alone. We're here at the Invisible Wounds Conference for Healthcare Professionals and we're going to talk to some of the presenters about uh, some of the coping strategies people have for mental health and some of the experiences that some of the speakers have been through. You're going to gain a lot of experience about mental health and we're here to hopefully break down the stigma around mental health so that all of us can talk about it openly because you're not alone. Hi, I'm now joined by uh, Mayor David Ingalls from the Municipality of Brockton. And David, of course, this conference is being host in Walkerton at the Best Western. And uh, you just wanted to give some words of welcome to the viewers. Certainly. When I found out uh, that uh, the conference was coming, I thought it would be a great opportunity for me to welcome them because uh, of the work that's, that's done by this group and the support that they give to, uh, to all of the first responders and healthcare folks. Yeah, and it's a big thing that we get to talk about it openly so that nobody feels alone, right? That's, that's right. That's, that's a good thing about this. Uh, a number of people coming together and uh, talking about issues in, uh, in health care and support. Those that are working in, uh, in first responders and, and nurses in the hospital, a tremendously demanding job and it can take its toll um, on a person's mental health. and. Uh, a lot of people just keep it inside and it's good to come together with a group of people like this uh, that we have t t this evening and tomorrow uh, to talk about their, their issues and, and uh, how the healthcare uh, needs to uh, expand services for these kind of situations. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, David. Good. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm here now with Jason McKenzie. He's a speaker on mental health topics. And uh, Jason, let's get uh, talk a little bit about uh, mental health and your own uh, struggles. Uh, so first, what was your emotional experience uh, like during your wife's illness and after her death? Yeah, so maybe my wife uh, passed away about eight and a half years ago. So she took her own life. She had a long history of mental health issues. and. Uh, so the way I look at that experience now is significantly different than I looked at it at the time. At the time, I um, really, it was, it sounds cliche, but it was a sort of a day-by-day -day experience. And I, I did not have a, a deep understanding of how much I had been hurt. Even, even after her death, I really didn't understand that. And so um, I, I viewed the emotional experience I was having as really a lot of weakness. I had, so I would have, you know, when things were very stressful or highly uncertain, I mean, I was terrified, I was overwhelmed, I, I felt like I was sometimes losing my mind. Um, and I really lost any kind of sense of normalcy. I, I didn't know what normal even was anymore. And so what, what I would have, like a normal human re reaction to this kind of stress, I just saw it as weakness. So like anxiety, feeling desperately sad, feeling terrified, um, all of those things to me were signs that the wheels were coming off the bus, right? Nice. And so I, I didn't understand that what I was experiencing was totally normal. And it was a huge opportunity for me to learn and to understand myself more deeply to help me navigate these waters. So I really uh, dealt with those emotions. The only, I really left myself few options. I didn't want to talk to anybody about it because, yeah, I just felt like talking about it was, I would take an hour, I would go cry on somebody's couch, and then I would come back out and I would all the same stuff would be waiting for me and I would have lost a productive hour. So I started drinking really heavily. And um, which kind of seemed to work, I mean, in my own, at the time, like, I mean, it, it, 
it appeared I felt less of those those feelings because uh, I was numbing them with alcohol. Yeah. But um, and then you know, it was, but it was interesting because after her death, uh, Cindy's death, I kept drinking for a long time, like for four years heavily after her death, and I I just did not have the self-awareness to recognize that how deeply I had been hurt. And so when I finally, you know, s sobered up and gave myself some time and space and I started to, you know, grieve her death and that grieving process kind of allowed me to r reframe how I was looking at the past, right? So instead of like being a victim of, it, instead of defining my past, present and future in terms of the trauma I experienced, it made me recognize that that experience was a critical part on the journey of me becoming who I was, or who I am, right? I mean, so, uh, but I had to go allow myself to finally experience these feelings, and it didn't really start happening until four or five years after her death, so. Yeah, so I look back on it now, and what I see is a person who suffered, you know, who was in a lot of pain, um, who felt like a failure a lot of the time, and was really having a hard time coping with it, um, and so that's one of the things I'm really passionate about talking about this subject is, is that, you know, our, our emotional experience is, is a part of who we are and yeah. don't, like, we should embrace it and we should experience it, we should learn from it and we should, we should move through it in a way um, that helps us, you know, learn more about ourselves, I guess. Wow, well, first of all, let me start by saying thank you for coming out and sharing it to let other people know that they're not alone if, if they come across the same situation. It's such a, a difficult situation to be in, uh, losing a loved one that way, uh, and to come here and talk about it is, is humongous in my eyes. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, so what is the idea? You have this idea of emotional excellence. What, what is it so important to you? <clears throat> yeah, so what I've learned is, so I run a community called Mental Health Warriors. It's an online community. Uh, it's got a couple hundred men in it. It's four men, uh, either dealing with mental health issues or supporting a loved one dealing with mental health issues. But what I see, and I also do, should maybe to provide some context, I do group coaching programs for men from around the world. And okay. what's really interesting to me is that I see in both of these communities, the same, a lot of the same things, which is when we look at this idea of understanding our emotions and how they make us human, whether you're dealing with mental health issues or you're dealing, or you're not, yeah. most people don't understand this topic because they, no one taught them. I mean, my dad didn't teach it to me, you know, he's a great guy, but it, you know, he grew up on a farm in rural Nova Scotia. He was not teaching me about like, like, how to embrace my emotional experience, right? So, um, and what I see with people who are dealing with mental health issues, which is, in my experience, is almost always related to trauma or a series, like a history of invalidating experiences. A lot of people that are in that, you know, that are suffering, they also don't have these tools. Right. So even if they hadn't, and from what I see, and I've seen it a, a whole bunch of times, is that even if they hadn't suffered trauma or invalidating experiences, they still would not be leading as meaningful and fulfilled lives as possible. Right. Because in order to do that, you need to develop self-awareness and self-mastery, and you need to teach yourself or learn these skills. Like, so when I talk about emotional excellence, it's not, it's not like you become emotionally excellent. I'm not saying it's not that, but it's, it's about how do you on a daily basis make uh, intentional and purposeful choices that move you closer in alignment with your values? So how do you even know what your, how do you know what your values are? How do you know what your vision is? How do you, do you know skills like emotional validation or understanding and overcoming limiting beliefs? Like there's a, a million different, you know, skills or tools you can learn, but understanding yourself and understand, and, and, and then having the, the, I guess the discipline and the self mastery to regulate your own behavior. Um, and then also understanding that you know you have an immense capability within you to serve other people like all of those things are critical to again creating that uh, a life that's meaningful and fulfilling not just for yourself but for all the people you come into contact with and that's though that is a critical part of someone's healing journey so when i talk about emotional excellence that's what i'm passionate about because i want people to see i'm not a doctor i'm not a therapist but what i do see is is a huge opportunity here to help people you know move through what they've experienced and then go on to serve other people and lead a, a powerful and significant life 
Absolutely, that's that's a that's a great way of putting it. Uh, so, what are some of the life changing benefits that come from being part of a, a tribe? Then, yeah. So, one thing that I see, especially when we talk about first responders, I mean, one of the things that draws people to the 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 culture of first responders. And my my first wife was a police officer, so this is why I'm this is why I often talk to uh, to first responder groups, but. I mean, part of the draw is the idea of being a part of something bigger than you, being a part of a tribe, whether it's, you know, a police, any of the first responder culture, it's, that has a draw for people, right? So often what happens is when people either, you know, experience trauma and they, they are dealing with an operational stress injury or whatever, they feel like they've been kicked out of the tribe. Yeah. And that's devastating. That's what happened to my, my wife. And she, um, her experience was that that alienation or being ostracized from this tribe that she had worked so hard to be a part of uh, was just another layer of humiliation on top of what was already a hugely difficult period in her life. And so what I want people to understand is, yeah, that's one tribe, but the concept of being a part of a tribe is universally applicable to us as human beings. We are we are social animals. You know, there's all kinds of evidence that says that when people are part of a tribe, their emotional and mental health, uh, their overall sense of wellness is better. But more than that, being a part of a tribe, you know, you are surround being a part of the right tribe. I would say is a way, an opportunity for you to get surrounded by people who actually care about you, who will hold you to a higher standard, will hold you accountable, will listen to you, will ask you for help. Like it's that 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 brotherhood in my I usually deal with men, but you know that that fraternity or sorority or that sense of brotherhood or sisterhood um, is just an incredibly important thing to help everybody elevate themselves and to have a place a a, a psychologically safe place to go right. when things are challenging and it is absolutely game-changing right so tribes can mean all kinds of things like you did mention you, you run the business where you, you help men um, or like first responders but tribes could be something as simple as uh, somebody's workplace or a church community or absolutely. a school community yeah I think that I think the most important thing is you're right and it that's I think the beauty of it is it's almost a limitless like infinite number of possibilities about what that can mean but I think what the most important component to a tribe is is the, that it's built on a foundation of psychological safety because what I see is whether it's one of our group coaching programs or whether it's in the mental health warriors community or whether it's on my teams at work, when people recognize that they are finally safe yeah. and that they can be themselves, it is incredible how fast the mask that we've been wearing comes off because none of us want to wear it, right? We all, fundamentally, we all want to be accepted and loved for who we actually are, not some, you know, stereotype or some, you know, role we think we're supposed to play. Um, that was one of the things that actually screwed me up quite a bit when I was a, when my wife was sick is I was so bought into the alpha male kind of persona. I was, you know, I thought that's how I was supposed to be a leader at work. I thought that's how I was supposed to be kind of a leader in my family. I thought that, you know, demonstrating weakness, like demonstrating that I didn't have my stuff together when all this was going on, I thought people would see me as a failure. I mean, right. how could I have had my stuff? Like, yeah, no kidding. I, no kidding, right? Like, I mean, I, it's so obvious to me now. And so part of what I love to do is like give people, help people understand that they can give themselves the permission to be imperfect. God. We're all imperfect. We're all yeah. messed up. We all have crazy thoughts that go through our head. You know, we all we all have insecurities. We all have strengths, and we have you know, like it, we're all this beautiful mix of craziness. Yeah. And let's just embrace it and accept that that's what makes life interesting. That's what makes relationships compelling, and that's what makes it also is what gives us the opportunity to learn. Because if you and I talk about something and you have a completely different point of view on it, man, I'm totally open to having my paradigm rearranged all the time. Right, so, but if we had the same point of view, we were the same, that opportunity would never present itself, right? So, but all of that requires psychological safety, and to me, that's the, that's the most important component of what makes a tribe, you know, one worth belonging to, I guess. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Yeah. Uh, so you're with Mental Health Warriors. Could yeah. you talk a little bit about mental health, like if somebody was interested in researching a little more about you or your yeah, business? Yeah, so, so my... The Mental Health Warriors community is a free community. It's okay. for, uh, it's for, like I said, men dealing with mental health issues or supporting loved ones. And it's just a Facebook group. Uh, we get together and we do, you know, we do calls sometimes, we have book clubs sometimes, but it's really just a safe place for people to come and just be heard. 
be seen and be heard, or even, even to just learn, even if you want to be silent. There's no expectation or like, you know, you don't have, there's no rules about what you need to do other than being respectful. You can participate as little or as much as you want. Right. Um, and then my, what I do with group coaching programs, I have a company called Adaptive Growth Systems and we help men. And it's, it's a, like I said, it's about the same stuff, right? So we help men, you know, make more, understand their values, live more values aligned lives and get in, in much deeper connection with their own emotional experience. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. If people want more information about the ADAPT, how, how could they go about getting that? Yeah, so they could go to adaptivegrowth.ca and they can also go to mentalhealthwarriors.com. And I'll just say one last thing. I have a podcast um, called The Emotionally Excellent Man Show. Uh, and there's probably about 70, 75 episodes on there. And so I talk to all kinds of amazing people. Um, about the, this, the, what we're talking about today. So. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Jason. That was my pleasure. Thanks so much. Here now with Jennifer Gregg, an author, writer, and body language trainer. And uh, Jen, the uh, stigma surrounding mental health issues is a known barrier to people getting the help they need. Uh, what other factors contributed to you waiting so long to reach out for your own help if you want to tell a little bit about your story? Uh, for me, it was kind of a double-edged sword because I've been in the fire service for over 25 years. So as a volunteer firefighter, we're used to being the people that are responding yeah. to the calls for help. We're, we're used to being the helpers. Firefighters and emergency service personnel are extremely effective in coming to other people's assistance but it might kind of be the same thing that plays against us when it comes to helping ourselves because we don't see how to do that. We're so externally focused. Yeah. We don't really know how to deal with it when it's us. Yeah, absolutely. No, that makes complete sense because uh, often you would just go, 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 and then all of a sudden it go, 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 gone. <laughs> like you just, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to um, kind of get an objective perspective on things when it's yourself and, and asking for help. And my husband also is a volunteer firefighter, so I think it was difficult for him as well um, to watch his wife go through something like this. And again, he's used to being able to fix things right away. So for both of us, it was difficult not to be able to, you know, putting out a fire, you know what to do. It's a certain set of steps that you go through and it's tangible and mental health issues are intangible obviously invisible, invisible wounds. So um, there's definitely, there was barriers there around being in emergency services and asking for help. For sure. When you did reach out for help, you were diagnosed with five different psychological disorders. Uh, what were they and how did you react to receiving that diagnosis? I was diagnosed with um, major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress right. disorder, and if as if that wasn't enough. I also had something called um, premenstrual, premenstrual dysmorphic disorder, which basically meant that around that time of the month when women tend to kind of get a little, I went right off the rails and uh, it was very difficult. Uh, it, it would spiral me into a, a really a depressive state yeah. every third week or whatever it was. So it was a lot more intense than the usual. And um, I think something like that, receiving a diagnosis like that would, probably overwhelm people but for me it was it was like a gift or a key because it it was an acknowledgement it was proof that okay this is what um, a psychiatrist has diagnosed you with you there really is something going on there you're not just flawed which is kind of what I believed or labeled myself as and for me it was like okay now I know what's going on where do I go from here for sure. What do I do? So it, it was actually a gift to me. I think it was a real turning point in my healing and recovery. Right, because you kind of have that, as, as a firefighter, you have that mentality of, well, let's fix it. Uh, now you know what the problem is. Now you can take that second step to fix the problems mm -hmm. or help cope with the problems. Right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's like we don't really take care of ourselves. It's like uh, if you thought of it in terms of your vehicle, if you're driving around a vehicle and you know it doesn't sound right or it's not running right, but you never take it in to get it looked at, it's never going to get any better and it's definitely going to get worse and, and we don't always kind of get our checkups or our, keep tabs on our mental health or physical health. We get complacent about it and then it, it's even harder to 
to come back from it when you've waited so long to get help. Your recovery is going to take a little bit longer or a lot longer in my case. But Yeah, I love that analogy of the car. Like you said, if you don't get an oil change every five or 8,000 kilometers mm -hmm. and you just let that car keep going, eventually yeah, at some point it's going to also break down. So we need mm -hmm. to think of our mental health as the same way, even if it's just uh, checking in with ourselves in mm -hmm. a quiet space to yeah, see what's you, going on. You need to keep tabs on what's going on inside, like the vehicle. And it's a vehicle is a great analogy because because it's something that people can relate to, right? They can kind of get an image of it and they understand that. So um, I think that's, it's a really good way to explain it. For sure, for sure. Uh, so you share in your presentation that you've been on medication for anxiety and depression um, three times over the past 17 years. Uh, how did you feel about being prescribed those medications or taking them? I, I've had varying emotions with being on medication. I fought it for a long time. I, I had been on it um, with postpartum depression. Uh, I knew I had a problem and I was struggling and I needed some help and I was on it for about six months. And, and then I think it was about 2008, I had some other issues and um, went back on it again. And even the third time, which was about a year and a half ago, I knew I was having issues and yet it still blows my mind to think that I still fought it. I, I still had that belief that people that were on medication were weak. Right. And that I was weak if I had to go back on medication. And it made me feel like I had not made any progress in healing over the years if I had to go back on medication. But I know men, like big, you know, tough strapping men, uh, very close to me that are on medication for whatever it might be, um, depression or anxiety or mood. And I would never think of describing them as weak. Right. So when I kind of realized that, I thought, why would I put that label on myself? Yeah. Like I would never describe either one of those people as weak as, or other people that I know that are on it. But for some reason, you judge yourself so much harder yeah. and so much differently or so much more critical. Um, so when I kind of was able to look at it from that perspective, I knew that it was it was a t it was one of those times where I needed to go back on it. Like you're not, from from my experience, I didn't need to stay on it. But when you're kind of down in a down in a hole or down in a ditch, you don't really have a very good perspective from that ditch. Right. And you really need to be able to get out of it on a level field before you can kind of address the issues that got you there in the first place. And that's what medication does. It kind of gets you up to a level playing field and, and back to yourself so that you're in a better state and you can start to address the underlying issues. But it still surprises me that I fought it that much, knowing that it had helped me in the past and, and everything I'd learned over the years. But I did go back on it and I've been off it now for a few months and I've been doing fine. So good. I'm knock on wood, I'm just doing good. <laughs> good, so that's interesting. So for you, uh, and, and we know everybody's different when it comes to mental health. Um, and again, that's maybe one of the challenges, but for you, it's, you, you know, you kind of get a feeling, right? That maybe I should go back to the psychologist or psychotherapist and get checked out again, and, and maybe I do need, is that kind of how it goes? I think uh, we kind of, we're, we're on our, our, our own worst enemies at times, and yeah. we, we still, uh, especially probably being a firefighter it was a part of it because I'm still okay I know what to do I've been here before I can fix it I can fix it I'll just I, I'll just I just need to do it but I found myself pushing harder and trying and it's like I think of it as trying to hold on to a rope or ropes or hold on to something so tightly and, and just make it work or hold it together and then you know like it's 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 not working and you just got to let go and, and reach out for help and, and accept help when it's offered to you. But um, yeah, I'm, it's one of those things that it's still kind of, there's such a stigma about it. And yeah. I just, it's unfortunate, but I've lived through it. So I understand it. Well, even yourself talking about, you know, admitting I was diagnosed with these and admitting that the medication worked is huge for somebody else that could be watching this saying, oh my gosh, I, all of a sudden I get it. Somebody else is talking about this publicly, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what? I think it's like cold medicine. When, when you're all stuffed up and you're feeling like heck and, and you know, you just want to feel better, you want to feel like yourself again, you, you reach for the cold medicine right. or the anti- histamine or whatever it is like it's really no different than that okay 
you know, you're just, you're not feeling like yourself. Yeah. There's something there that can help you feel like yourself. And it's not always, and it's not for everyone, but there's times where you just need it to help you feel better again, just like you take cold medicine. Right. Yeah, that makes you just might sense. be on it a little bit longer. But really, if you can simplify it like that, I think it helps to reduce the stigma. For sure, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, so there are many tools and resources for those struggling with depression and anxiety. Uh, so I, you have talked a little bit about what worked for you, but could you go into more detail what you found was the most effective? Um, with the therapist that I worked with, I worked with um, CBT as well, Cognitive Behavior Therapy. Okay. And I found that hugely effective because from, in my personal experience, my problem was uh, largely the thoughts I was thinking. So the, the limiting beliefs and, and the, the faulty thoughts that we have that are kind of like, I think of it as a groove in a record. And it's been overplayed so much that that groove is like permanent and you just kind of got to move that needle across the record and get out of that groove. But with CBT, it helps you look at the thoughts you're thinking and pick them apart because we believe our thoughts and most of the time those thoughts are, are limiting to us or they're negative. They're not healthy and they're not helping us. So if you have the awareness that you, you have the ability to really sit down and using a thought record, which I used a lot of, you kind of write down the thought, write down the feeling, write down what it means, you process it and pick it apart and you get to the underlying element of it, which is usually something happened at some point, you internalized it, and then when anything kind of similar to that happens, it unconsciously kind of takes you back to that first um, experience and when you internalized it. So it's for me, it was very, very effective to really investigate the negative thoughts that were making me feel so bad and, and pick them apart and find out what was underlying because it's all mostly subconscious you're not even aware you just know that you feel crappy and you don't know why yeah, and sure. you keep replaying that thought over and over again and of course you're not going to get feeling any better so um, really investigating your thinking and, and really questioning it uh, there's something called the work by Byron Katie which is another tool that's kind of like CBT it's um, investigating your thoughts and uh, it's like four simple questions you do, and it's amazing. I found it completely amazing at how effective it was for me, especially with some of the post-traumatic stuff that I was going through, images and thoughts um, that trace back to childhood abuse for me. It really helped make me realize that the event happened, but I didn't need to carry the emotional reaction of the event for the rest of my life. Okay. So it really helps dismantle things and take the, the emotion out of it. The event will always be there, but it's how you react to it. And that all goes back to our thinking. So anything like that that enabled me to kind of pick apart my thinking, and I'm a journaler, so it was easy for me to sit down and write. Yeah. I know that's not everybody's thing, but um, those were two things that I found super helpful. My therapist was fantastic. I had a, a buddy that had gone through similar issues, so it really helped for me to have somebody that had experienced um, severe depression and mental health issues and is has come through it and is a very successful author and speaker. Wow. I think it really helps. You need a support system in place. Absolutely. Definitely doctors, therapists, your family. But having somebody that you know has had thoughts and feelings that you've had, um, I think that's really a big key because it's that understanding. You know that person has been there because you can be surrounded by people that love you, but if they don't understand, they haven't been there, it's hard for, for you to relate to them and them to relate to you. Yeah, I hear this from a lot of people that uh, even just getting up and going for a walk, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and just in nature can, can help mm -hmm. clear up whatever they're going through and focus them and, and get perspective. Because mm -hmm. you have all those negative chemicals in your brain and, and in your body and, and you, it's the last thing you want to do is go for a walk or talk about it, but really those are the two things that are going to help you with it. So yeah, for sure. you got to do it. <laughs> Uh, so what would you like to see change for people uh, seeking support for mental health issues then? And I think the other thing that I've seen, I've experienced myself and I saw my husband go through, is when you're, you actually make the phone call for help, whether it's to a therapist or to a doctor, and they don't, or your, your doctor's office, and people don't understand what kind of a place you're in because maybe you haven't communicated it enough or the person answering the phone doesn't have enough training, right. and they give you an appointment for two or three weeks down the road. 
and and that's it's not going to help you like you need to see somebody right away and i think it's unfortunate that there's such a struggle because it's hard enough to reach out for help and make that initial phone call when you're struggling yeah. and if you don't get results right away it really causes you to think okay well i tried and that didn't work so i'm not doing it again or it's not that important or you know you might be in a position where waiting two or three weeks is waiting way too long to get help Absolutely. Um, and finding the right therapist i was very lucky with mine i thought she was fantastic and worked with her right till she retired or I'd probably still see her every once in a while just right. to check up and make sure I'm still doing good but um, I know people that have had a therapist and it wasn't a good experience for them and that was it they wouldn't try it again so it's kind of I don't know how you really address that but well they say you should uh, like most therapists aren't going to be upset if you try them and you t the two of you aren't aren't connecting yeah. for whatever reason. It's not that they're not a bad therapist, just that you two aren't connecting. So I've heard that from a couple of therapists mm -hmm. that if I don't work for you, please try another therapist. Like don't just stop at me right. and say all of them are the same. Yeah. Right. So that's right. another big thing to get out there. And probably that uh, you can go pick up the phone and call a therapist. You don't have to wait for like a referral from your doctor kind of yeah. thing too. And you can try a different one. And it's not yeah. the end of the world if you try the one down the street and they don't work. Mm -hmm. Please try another one. Right. And that's fantastic if there's therapists out there that are aware of that and they're like very upfront about it. And if you don't think I'm a good match, then, you know, try somebody else or maybe offer other resources other therapists for people to try and, and maybe that's the best way to kind of approach that is from the therapist point of view because they're in a much better place to see that it's not working yeah absolutely well thank you Jennifer for sharing your story with us that's the one of the biggest steps in mental health is hearing from other people in all walks of life uh, their own journey because who knows who you could be out there watching going oh, I get it <laughs> it helps to know there's other people out there and I know that for me it's, you know, it's kind of scary to talk about this stuff sometimes, but the more I do it, the easier it gets. And it's just, it's that one person that might be struggling yeah. that if you can help them, it's definitely worth it because people aren't, you're not going through it alone, but that's the biggest problem is that you think you are. Here now with Dorian Charette from West for Youth Online. And Dorian, uh, how did you, first of all, how did you hear about West for Youth? Um, yeah, so West for Youth is really involved in the community a lot. Yeah. So um, they came into my school actually, and there was a, a school presentation, and that's kind of how I first um, found out about it. Right. And so then you decided to get involved with it. So what do you do now with West for Youth? Um, so right now, I, well, before I, in the, uh, like younger years in uh, high school. I was, uh, I think, grade 10 when I first started um, with the West Crew. So that's like the youth volunteer committee. Right. Uh, and we kind of do that, that uh, youth perspective on the whole organization and like make decisions about that. So I was on that for a bit. And then I uh, moved up to like the core group of that. So kind of like the executive group. Um, so we, we just kind of were a smaller group. So if, say, there wasn't a big fundraiser, we didn't need all of us. Um, so then I, uh, I then be, like moved on and I actually got a job with them. So cool. um, yeah, so now I'm the assistant uh, community relations coordinator. <laughs> That's my official role. Awesome. So yeah. what, what do you get out of doing that role then is that, I mean, working with this wonderful organization? Yeah. Um, I just think it's really cool to like give back and especially just working with uh, an organization that I really believe in. Yeah. Um, and it's something I'm passionate about is mental health and advocism. So like it's really uh, it's really rewarding for both myself and then the hopefully the, the work I do is helping other people too. Excellent. Well Dorian, thank you so much for your time yeah. and thank you for the work you're doing with West for Youth. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Here now with Randy May, an author, a mindfulness teacher, and counselor. And uh, Randy May, we want to talk a little bit about uh, our self-care journey. So, uh, where does one start when they are ready to do a self-care journey? Yeah, I think the, really the question becomes for people: we think it's this big restructuring in their life that they have to do, right. uh, but it really starts out with just asking one simple question: What do I need to be well? And that's really where we start, is getting somebody just to pause, uh, turn inside for a moment, 
reflect and ask themselves that really important question. And usually when I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, we actually close our eyes, we take some deep breaths in, get settled into the body, and then just listen to what comes up after asking the person to get themselves to kind of turn inside and say, what do I need to be well right now? Right. And then they actually start to notice, oh, sleep. <laughs> oh, uh, maybe I need some time for myself. And these things start to come up uh, because most of us know what we need, uh, but it's just a matter of creating a space that you can actually be in to ask yourself that question and start to take an inventory. Right. So that would probably lead into the, the second question I have for you is like, what does uh, self-care mean? So you kind of touched on a bit where some people are like, oh, I need sleep or I just need a quiet moment to reflect is that kind of like what does self-care mean yeah like when you start to think about self-care it's where most of us especially as helping professionals healthcare professionals so good at taking care of everybody else under the sun uh, but sometimes when it comes back to taking care of our own self it becomes a challenge uh, and so i like to look at it from the perspective of uh, when a child comes asking to be loved, to be cared for, to be fed, uh, most of us will say, yes, I'll feed you, I'll take care of you, I'll love you right now. Uh, but when we need those same things, we're like, let me just do one more thing, let me pause. Uh, and so the idea is self-care is whatever you offer through compassion and love and kindness to others around you and what you would offer to a child, can I offer that back to myself now? Right. So that whole idea of self-compassion and self-care uh, Self-compassion, the definition is suffering, uh, being with somebody, uh, supporting them during their suffering, their experience of suffering. And so the idea is, can I offer that self-compassion, open myself up to accept where I am, wherever I am on my journey, and offering that kindness back to myself. Right. That's so it's, it's, we're already doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, how do I turn that tap back a little bit so I can offer it back to myself? Right. Good, that's a good description of it. How does someone uh, begin their mindfulness journey then? Like uh, these days, we're on a 24 seven schedule. Yeah. You know, a lot of people work jobs where they can get a whole, the, the job is 24 seven, especially first yeah. responders or, or um, medical professionals. Yeah. Uh, so how do you even start that mindfulness journey when you're in such a busy world? Yeah, the, real, the reality is life is busy and we're all called in a thousand directions. And sometimes people think mindfulness is I need to meditate one hour a day uh, in the morning, in, on my lunch, and you know before I go to bed at night. And that's not always realistic for everybody. Uh, but the idea is, can I just be present in the here and now? So really the question becomes now, like what is mindfulness? It's being in the present moment. So allowing my mind and my body to actually be in the here and now. Because most of the time where our body is here, but the mind is jumping from future to past, and it's going right. back and forth, and it's like, oh, I'm here, and then it dips from future to past. And if you think about it, none of those things are actually occurring in the here and now. Uh, and so mindfulness is, can I allow myself to be in the present moment? And for people who are working busy jobs, sometimes it's just stepping outside of your office, letting the sun touch your face, taking a deep breath in, and feeling your breath and your body at the same place at the same time. So using the breath as a tool to get you into the here and now. Uh, and sometimes it could be five minutes before your feet touch the ground, uh, before everybody under the sun asks you to do a thousand things. Uh, can I just be in my own body with my breath as my tool to guide me back to that peace inside? Uh, so it's just, it could be just little things. 10 minutes here, even if you're in the shower, you know, <laughs> can I just take five minutes in the shower just to be, feel the water on my skin, feel the temperature, just to be in the here and now. Yeah, instead of jumping over, I need to get out of the shower and go here, or yeah. oh, I forgot to do this before I got into the shower. Right? Yeah, just like, the idea is can I just slow a moment down for a minute and just be, actually be in it. Uh, if I'm eating my lunch, on my lunch break, if I even have one sometimes, uh, can I just enjoy the taste of the food? Uh, and sometimes we'll realize, do I even like this if I slow down to actually be with that? Uh, or even noticing, wow, the food that's before me, how many hands did it take to make this food? So that whole mindfulness piece, it doesn't have to be uh, a whole restructuring, but introducing it into little, little pieces, little ways, bit by bit. So maybe 10 minutes in the morning before you start your day. Maybe the 10 minutes is in the shower because that's just what it is. Yeah. Uh, you're in the car before you transition from work to home. Can I just take 10 minutes to breathe and just be here? Notice what's, um, what I'm storing in my body um, from 
where have I worked? Am I carrying anything with me? Is it sitting in my shoulders? Okay, let me just breathe and bring my shoulders down. Then I can start the car. Great. So it's just little things here and there that, that can start people on that journey. Yeah, I think that's a good, like you said, little things like that is good. Uh, I've heard a lot of people when they go to start meditating or trying to be mindful, they go, like you said, I, oh, I need to, they, all the experts say, I need to do it for an hour. And so I got to get that hour. And then they get stressed out over trying to <laughs> become yeah. mindfulness and it does it just ruins the whole experience yeah. so. well, why isn't my mind being still <laughs> yes right? for sure you get your mind still all of a sudden it wanders well that's normal yeah. that's what the mind wants to do yeah. you're not trying to still the mind you're just allowing the mind to just be observing when you begin just observing it it's okay the mind's just still jumping around okay it's here but the fact that you're just slowing down to notice it is step one yeah for sure for sure uh, so what can someone do if they feel burnt out uh, burnout is a thing we hear a lot in the news and in mental health uh, so what could somebody do if they if they feel they're approaching that point or at that point yeah I mean the real thing is to pause to just stop take a moment just to take an inventory uh, and some that sounds so like silly to just say just stop but the idea is find a moment just to pause and take an inventory of what's happening in your life uh, there's the practice of journaling I think is so underrated uh, you could just pause and say okay I'm feeling burnt out when am I feeling burnt out? What are the things making me feel tired and exhausted? What are the things that are bringing me joy that can replenish me? And then when you start to look at that and you can say, oh, these things here is where I'm giving a lot to. These things over here are maybe the things that can fill me up. How can I start to figure out how can I balance yeah. this list out? And not only balance, but integrate some of that joy uh, some of that pause back into my life again. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, so what has been the biggest part of, of your healing and journey then? Yeah, there's really four things. <laughs> uh, so counseling one, I think that everybody who provides support to other people yeah. is really important and valuable to have somebody to go to. Um, because even though, uh, whether it's a healthcare professional or a first responder, quick and really great at helping other people, uh, but sometimes we also need to be seen and heard uh, and feel like someone's helping us as well. And so counseling matters, I think. Uh, and the other piece is meditation. Uh, meditation has helped me so much with just allowing myself to recognize that even though I might feel like there's chaos going on, I can actually turn inside myself and there is some sort of peace there and it's waiting for me. So that meditation piece has been really important for me. Uh, reflection, uh, so through journaling has been really helpful for me. I mean, I have my journals. I just found one from when I was 11. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. <laughs> I have a lot of journals, but I can see the evolution of my thoughts and yeah. where I was, what I thought I couldn't get through. And it, journaling is really, you create your own evidence. It's like an evidence document. Sure. And you get to see, well, that time of my life was challenging, but I made it through. Or this is how I made it through. So that's been helpful for sure. Um, so there's counseling, <laughs> meditation, reflection. But the other piece is also that compassion. Okay. So the compassion to, towards myself yeah. and that self-acceptance has been really huge. Uh, and that's not an overnight thing, that's like a process, uh, progress thing of how can I speak to myself more kindly? How can I accept that things aren't always going to be perfect right. uh, and that's going to be okay? Yeah, and kind of don't put yourself down, that sort of stuff, right? Yeah, our self-talk is so powerful, yeah. like the mind is so powerful. And so if, you know, you wake up in the morning and that tape's already saying something negative, you know, then you go to work and then another tape from someone else starts playing towards you, then we've got the cycle going, so, yeah. Sure. yeah. Good. So about yourself then, uh, you're an author and a counselor. Yeah. What are some of the books that you've written on the subject? Yeah, so I've written a book called Reflections in My 20s, uh, Searching for Meaning. Uh, my 20s <laughs> was busy. I was a crisis counselor during my 20s. Uh, started off being a mom and all that sorts of, all sorts of things like that, but lots of challenges. And my book, Reflections in My 20s, actually started with me journaling. Uh, and I used to start to journal on my lunch breaks. And then I had a bunch of these journal <laughs> entries, and I thought, like, if I start to put them together and then start to form some questions that people can start to journal themselves, then it's a short book, but it gives people some food for thought and uh, opportunity to pause. Uh, and I made those questions. They're called Veneration in Daily Life. 
So each short chapter has something called veneration in daily life. And what that means is, you think of the word veneration, we venerate saints, we honor saints. Okay. The idea is how can I just honor daily life? How can I just slow down and ask myself some questions and see how I'm doing, doing an honest check-in with yourself? Cool. Yeah. If people want more information, is there a website they can get? Yeah, absolutely. So my website is www.randymay.com. So that's R-A-N-D-I-M-A-E.com. Great. Thank you yeah. so much for your time, Randy May. Thank you so much. Here now with Neil Klegas from Meridian Credit Union, and Neil, Meridian uh, is sponsored this documentary, so why, what was the impetus behind sponsoring this documentary? Well, Meridian Credit Union is uh, a, a business that really wants to support the local community, yes. and we felt that it was important to support um, an event where we are looking after our medical professionals in a way that will help them look after all of us better in the future. So we felt that it was very important to support the, the doctors and the nurses in this area so that they can do the best for us. Absolutely, because if, if they can't do the best, we, we need them to help us, right? Yeah, so, so we're, we're very happy to be able to sponsor this and we're very proud of that. Excellent, well thank you so much for your sponsorship, Neil. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm here now with Aaron Gibb, a psychotherapist with Innate Health Hanover Counseling and Psychotherapy. And uh, Aaron, we're going to talk a little bit about mental health and uh, mostly what is compassion fatigue? So compassion fatigue is, if I could quote Francois Mathieu, and she is a compassion fatigue author. She's Canadian. She has said that it's the profound emotional and physical erosion that takes place when helpers are not able to refuel and regenerate. So that's one way to look at it. Um, in my own words, I would say it is really a distancing, an emotional and physical numbing that happens when helpers feel overwhelmed by the suffering. So it's kind of a way that, not on purpose, but it's a way to protect ourselves, anyone really, I'm gonna use helper broadly, from the suffering that we're exposed to. And what it looks like, some of the symptoms, I guess you'd call them, would be this emotional numbing. Um, there's a lot. It's irritability, decreased empathy and sympathy. But for the person who's experiencing it, they're really exhausted and feeling overburdened by all the suffering. Right. So uh, if you take compassion fatigue and put it beside, uh, you know, burnout and PTSD, um, I bet you a lot of people in the public would, would know when they're burnt out or they know what PTSD is. But what, what's the difference between those two mental conditions and compassion fatigue? That's a good question. Yeah, burnout is much more popular and it's used a lot. It's used in different ways and PTSD, yeah, it's very common now to talk about it. So compassion fatigue, the interesting thing about all this is that some of the symptoms, if you want to call them that, or the experiences of the person overlap. Um, but really, one way to understand compassion fatigue as it relates to those is that burnout could be thought of as a workload that really feels insurmountable and chronic stress that comes from that. There's also an exhaustion element. It's often it happens in environments where the person is not supported, they don't feel supported, there's a lot of stress and maybe a toxic environment, okay. and they could never seem to keep up. It's just this mounting workload. Compassion fatigue has that element of this kind of unending suffering that the helper or the person is going through. So there's this element of that, exhaustion, and it just feels like it won't end, and often people are unsupported. Right. But where it's different is that burnout can happen in all kinds of different settings. You could be a shift worker and experience burnout. Compassion fatigue is going to happen when you're exposed to the suffering of others. And it's where you're exposed to secondary traumatic stress, it's called. Okay. Where that differs um, from PTSD, generally that's where someone has experienced primary traumatic stress. Yeah. So primary traumatic stress is when something happens to you. It can be on the job, can be in your life, in your childhood, in your adulthood, in the form of a trauma. Secondary traumatic stress 
which is what most people who are experiencing compassion fatigue have been exposed to, is the profound suffering of others. And with, when people get to the place of compassion fatigue, is that they have often been exposed to unrelenting demands and the suffering of others chronically. Right. And this is the way that we kind of protect ourselves in these kind of environments and cultures where we don't know what else to do. Right. And it develops insidiously. So and PTSD is really primary trauma, generally happens to the person, although it can be as a result of secondary trauma as well. Exposure to other people's suffering and being horrified. Yeah. But it's a cluster of symptoms where a person really experiences what we would all experience at the time of a trauma, but for a long time. So the fight, flight, and freeze that we'd all experience at the time of trauma, with PTSD, that kind of sets in for people and their brain changes as a result and a lack of safety starts to permeate their life. And they have symptoms of that, like flashbacks, nightmares. So I guess the biggest difference, since there is some overlap, is that compassion fatigue usually develops after being exposed to the suffering of others, and it just feels unending. So I can see how that uh, <clears throat> is probably pretty particular with um, medical workers, first responders. They would come across those situations of experiencing the grief of others fairly often in their day-to-day -day duties. Yes. So. The grief, the trauma, yeah. the pain, suffering. And actually, first responders experience a lot of primary trauma as well. Absolutely. And that they're in harm's way. Nurses, we think of them as, I think, experiencing secondary trauma in that they're exposed to the suffering that seems to never end. Think of an emergency room nurse. Yeah. That's what they do. But many nurses are hurt on the job by people who are, they're trying to help because they, um, for many reasons. So it's interesting that we have these definitions because we need to, because we're human, but there's a tremendous amount of overlap. And I think the thing that you talked about is true uh, first responders, nurses, healthcare, but just being the caregiver of someone who works in those fields. Oh, absolutely. Also, there can be compassion fatigue, burnout, and post traumatic stress just as a result of what it's like to be with someone over long periods of time and not even realize that that's starting to impact you. Yeah, I think one area that probably not a lot of people think of that could get compassion fatigue as well beyond the, the uh, medical professionals, first responders, mm -hmm. would be like a clergy, like a, a chaplain, somebody who goes into the hospitals often and sits with people who are in palliative care or takes that grief from people that come uh, in and want to express a problem and talk about it. Yeah. Uh, that's a whole other area that uh, I get a little worried about sometimes uh, with our, our uh, with the minister that we have at our church that he's doing fine, but uh, I'm always checking. How are you doing? Just like to give that person that release, right? Or or see if they have the compassion fatigue. A whole other area that not a lot of people probably think about. No, absolutely. That it's amazing how when you start to look, how the commonality is compassion. It's being there with other people. So whether it's a parent who has a special needs child, then goes to work caring for other people, comes home, it, uh, it's amazing how we are made to give compassion. But with the unending nature of it, such as what you're kind of describing, how he's, your pastor is kind of always in that role, people are coming to him a lot of the time because they're suffering. Or he's going to visit people in, uh, in hospitals or palliative care, right? Yeah. Uh, so when you're caring for these people, what are some of the protective factors when, uh, that maybe we could watch out for as people in the general public, uh, uh, just to see if these people have that kind of symptom? It's interesting to look at it that way, because I would say that the person who's thinking about the other person should probably first look at how compassion fatigued are they. Because there's this transference of it that happens in that we want to care give for the caregiver who's caregiving for others. And if, if I'm going to care give for someone who's caregiving for others, I'm wanting to first look at 
how compassion fatigue do I feel? How much compassion and empathy can I have? How full is my tank, so to speak? Yeah. So I think the first thing is to look at how much empathy do you have to give? How irritable do you feel? How exhausted do you feel as the person who's looking? Yeah. Um, and some of the risk factors, I'll tell you first, and then the resilience factors, which are the key here. But the risk factors really are chronicity. So it's this chronic nature of primary secondary trauma. So that it just feels unending. Um, another risk factor is low support or toxic environments. And another one in particular for compassion fatigue, post-traumatic stress, burnout, is childhood trauma. So if I'm the caregiver for someone who's caregiving, or I'm a first responder, a health professional, a teacher, a clergyman, I think a really important thing to look at is if I have childhood trauma that is unresolved, going and caring for others sensitizes my nervous system further okay. and puts me at a greater risk. So the protective factors are really the inverse of that. If you have childhood trauma, resolve it. Because without resolving that, uh, human beings are at a pronounced risk for a lowered lifespan, every chronic illness, uh, vocational issues, all kinds of things. Uh, childhood trauma is detrimental to a human being. Certain therapies are effective for that. And it doesn't necessarily even mean therapy. It means looking at that and getting support. The other thing is getting quality support. So any caregivers getting their own quality support. And what I mean by that is that um, quality support, somebody who really cares about you and can listen and who isn't compassion fatigued. Right. And this could be anyone, but somebody who genuinely connects with you. Sure. That's the key. We're made to overcome everything with quality support, we will heal. Right. Um, often that's lacking, so that's a place to start. Quality support. Um, and if people can, decrease the chronic nature. So if there's this chronic need to give at work, see if they can balance that at home with getting help. Another resilience factor that's really important, and it's difficult because it's countercultural. Um, it is to not silence the suffering inside of ourselves and to be able to listen to the suffering that others have. It means really working on what's called EQ or emotional intelligence. So what we're often shown as little kids and as we age and become helpers and adults in our society, a badge of honor is to kind of become distant and to numb pain so that we aren't suffering as well. But the key to really living fully alive, not numb, is to learn to identify and express emotion. Well, I thank you very much for talking about a subject uh, that doesn't get talked about very much, compassion fatigue. Um, if people wanted to reach out to you to talk more about it, how could they do that, Erin? Sure, well they could uh, email me or check out my website and go through that, which is innatehealthhanover.ca. Great, awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Erin. No problem. Well, I hope you gained some insight into mental health topics and I hope we broke down some of the stigma surrounding mental health. I want to thank all the uh, people we had on the documentary for sharing their experiences, their stories. Um, some things we heard might have been very difficult topics for you to hear, uh, but it's all things we need to get out in the open because in the end you are not alone and everybody's mental health is important. Uh, if you want more information about the Invisible Wounds conferences, you can visit the website on your screen. I want to thank 
thank again Meridian Credit Union for sponsoring this documentary and uh, the work that they're doing in the community. And Deborah McDonald, a huge coordinator that did a lot for this documentary, lining up, and her husband Bruce also helped out with the documentary too. So again, I hope we broke down some of the mental health stigmas for you because in the end, you're not alone. The preceding program was brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom.